We've got 33 guys really excited to get back out there and, and get on the field and do our thing. So uh, we've been waiting for this day for a while. Given your success, are they more excited than other seasons? I think that's fair to say. I think there's uh, a little confidence, you know, brewing and, and uh, um, you know, a feeling like you know, we, we've reached one of our goals and, and we'd love to get back out on the field and get better and see how far we can go. And, and so I think guys are really ready to get to work. Can you talk about your extension and staying another two years plus? Yeah, you know, um, really excited about that. Uh, I would love for this to be the last place I do my thing and, and uh, um, this contract may do that for me and I was, I was flattered when Jen asked me if I'd want to consider that and uh, we have a great relationship. She's been great to me. This place has been great to my family and, and uh, so we are really flattered about that and as I said at that time we're really happy with where we are and we think our, our best days are ahead of us so all good stuff. You've been at this for a few years now and certainly had some, some success recently. Can you talk a little bit about, do you feel that you're out there recruiting, you're talking to kids not only local but you know, within the region up and down the West Coast. Do you, you get a feel that that success is, is being recognized out there in the recruiting world? Yeah, the recruiting uh, wars are always battles and uh, you know our, our goal, our primary goal is to try to keep the best players in the state of Washington, you know, in Seattle and at our place. And, and that's a challenge because of all the talented schools in the Northwest and, and people are coming in here from all over the country trying to find players. So uh, the more success we have here, obviously the more it translates with the local kids. And we don't feel like we can play at the national level unless we, we recruit nationally, but we have to do a great job at home first. So the fact that we've won, uh, I think, on the national stage with some really good local players uh, has helped us, you know, branch out to other places. And, and people have seen us on the Pac-12 network. They saw us in Omaha last year. They saw us at Fullerton. I mean, if I had a dollar for every person that approached me about our Super Regional final game, I wouldn't have needed that contract extension. I mean, it was just, you know, people saw that, appreciated it, and, and really uh, took notice of it. And that, that's helped us. It's helped us get into people's living rooms in Arizona, in Southern and Northern California, uh, all over the country. And, and this building, you know, it goes without saying, when we get people here and they see this place, uh, I don't want to say they're shocked, but they're really impressed with what we, what we can offer as a program, so it, it's really helped. It's helped us get guys on campus. Lindsay, how, how would you assess this year's team's strengths and the weaknesses, and what makes you think you think go as far as last year's team or even farther? I just think we have really good balance, and I think we have uh, some older guys who, you know, obviously have played in Omaha, have been through some things. Joe Waynehouse is back. Nick Kale is back. Braden Ward uh, led the Pac-12 in stolen bases. Last year is back, Mason Cirillo's back, Christian Jones is back, Jordan Jones is back, Bergman's back. Uh, I just think we have some young guys who are ready to take the next step and could really um, explode in terms of the work they've done. And I think we have some key guys back in some veteran roles in the three, four, five spot in the batting order, and I really think that's important. Right. Yeah, that's the biggest question we're going to have. And I think uh, the people I talk to about our club, local and nationally, that's the question they have is how do you, re you know, replace those two guys? And, and the, the obvious answer is you don't replace them. But we have, we have some battles going on there that, that I've really enjoyed watching. Um, Ramon Bramasco from Cerritos Community College in Norwalk in Southern California. And this guy's a really good player. I mean, he is a baseball player from the time he wakes up in the morning to the time he goes to bed at night. He's an accomplished defender. And uh, um, both those guys, both Graf and Levi, were really fun to watch because they made everything look so easy. I mean, Ramon's a blue collar guy and he has to work at it, but he's fun to watch also. I think he's gonna win the shortstop job and, and do a nice job for us. And um, a guy we're excited about who's a local guy is Noah Sue, 
at second base who played for us a little bit last year, and he is a really good player from Mercer Island. He's gotten a lot better in a year, and if we can keep him healthy, I think it's going to be a different dynamic up the middle, but I think people will appreciate it, and uh, they'll have fun watching those guys. And, and they're a tick behind where we were last year, but I think they're going to get there. What's that a little bit about your catcher, returning catcher? You have a returning catcher. Yeah, guys coming in, turning in and out. You lost nine guys, 22 returning. How big of a deal is it to have a returning Congress established catcher come back? I think that, like, like we all say in this profession, you want to be strong up the middle, and, and Nick Kale really gives us – you know, not just the numbers and uh, the production, but I mean, he gives us a calmness back there, and I think that's his biggest strength is his demeanor. And he's really professional. He's a professional hitter. He's really gotten better on the catch and throw part of it. And just him having been through the wars uh, for three years, I mean, we, we laughed the other day, he and I, about, you know, we had him in left field a few times his freshman year because we had Joey Morgan here who was a third round pick, and we were doing whatever we could do to get Nick in the lineup. And he's come a long way from not looking very good in left field to uh, to being you know a guy people describe as potentially a high draft pick behind the plate. But just his presence, just the leadership, and uh, how calm he is in all these situations. I think I mean that's really valuable. A little less stress for you, maybe. Absolutely, I mean, it's like having a coach on the field, and and you know hopefully he can clean up some of our messes as well. Had three pitchers from British Columbia. What's the pipeline there? You know, obviously, this is a place where kids can come from that area and be away from home, but not that far away from home. And all those kids have families that are really supportive on the academic side and recognize what a great opportunity this is school-wise. And the fact that we've um, won some games in the last few years makes this a really great option for those kids. They're all talented players, um, all kids on the mound who can help us, and, and they're all going to be I think an important part of the mix this year. Jody Mears was such a force for you. Who do you see as your Friday night guy and your rotation right now? You know, I think the candidates, uh, Bergman's going to be a weekend guy without question. Um, and we got him back last year, mid-year after he had had Tommy John, and he's been healthy now for a year and, and been 90 to 94 and a great competitor. And uh, we've just never really seen him healthy for a long time period of time and, and now he is and, and he's been really impressive so he'll be involved in the on the weekend Jordan Jones will be involved he's been in the rotation since he was a, a freshman and and really it's kind of in the Joe Demiris mold where he pitches backwards and he can use both sides of the plate and he holds runners well he feels his spot well uh, he's been through the wars he's pitched in Omaha he's pitched in a super regional he's pitched at Oregon State He's pitched in some huge games, so you know he'll be another guy we count on on the weekends. Stevie Emanuel's has been uh, unbelievable for us this fall. Anywhere from 91 to 95 with a really improved breaking ball and a wipeout slider, and he's he's just been so impressive this fall. You'd really like to see him out of the bullpen if you could afford to do that. The eighth or ninth inning, he'd be pretty good. Jack DeCuman, left-hander who started. One of the British Columbia kids you're talking about, a left-hander who started some games for us last year, uh, just has that left-handed funk where there's some deception there, and he's kind of the original crafty left-hander, and, and uh, our guys will tell you, you know, I'd rather see it come in 93 miles an hour from the right side than 86 miles an hour from Jack DeCumman on the left side. It's just a funky deal. So he had a good fall and is somebody who can work his way into the weekend, and Chris Michaels um, local guy, third-year guy, left-handed pitcher. has been up to 91, 92 for us this year with a good slider. And, and Chris is another candidate that you could see on the weekend. So uh, the two we're sure about um, are both Jones and Bergman. And we'll figure the rest out uh, by the time we get to Irvine. Just the way you finished last season, is there, did you see a difference, maybe a change in some of your players and how they approached the offseason and coming into this year? What we really liked about last year was we, we had talked about um, how the player-driven leadership part of this deal, if you really understand what it's about, is uh, what separates good teams and great teams. And, and you know, I've, I've told our coaching staff this. I've told our returners this. By the time we got to Coastal, our guys didn't even need us anymore. They could, they could, they could have run the pregame stuff. 
they could have run the game. I mean, we just kind of got out of their way and let them do their thing and, and uh, because they took ownership of it and believed in what we had talked about. And, and we have some key components back from that group who, you know, who feel like at the end, you know, it might have taken its toll on us to travel to Coastal, to travel to Fullerton, to have to travel to Omaha. What might it be like if we could play those games here and have a little bit more left in the tank when you get to Omaha? And I think that's kind of the goal. Got Shane Wayhouse returning this year. Is pitching still an option for him, or are we going to see him? In the we'll use Joe out of the bullpen. Joe, Joe threw on uh, Wednesday when we inter squatted and threw some good sliders and, and uh, you know, that's more an issue for me is, you know, making sure we keep him healthy so he can be in the lineup every day offensively, but uh, he can definitely help us on the mound. You also return three starters from your outfield. Um, how nice is that to have when you have all this change happening on the field? It's great. It's great to have Christian Jones back. He's hurt right now. He just got a pin taken out of his thumb. He had an issue in summer ball and it got worse and worse, so they finally had to do a repair on that, and we'll have him back by the time we open up Pac-12 play. But I really think CJ is poised for a breakout season, and it would be nice if we could pencil him in behind Wayne House and have those two lefties back to back. And, and so I think CJ is ready to explode. And, and Mason Cirillo is just, you know, Mason's as steady. He's one of those guys. He hit 340 last year, and people don't talk about him, and uh, because he doesn't say a word. And you don't notice him because he does everything right. But Mason's, you know, what you want all your players to be like. And, and like I said, Braden Ward's about ready to explode. He stole 35 bases in the Northwoods League this summer. He ran almost a 6-2-60 for us in the fall, which, which every scout in the Northwest said was the best 60 time they'd seen anywhere in the United States. So, yeah, the outfield is, is fun to watch. Those guys are pretty accomplished. Were Fullerton and Coastal Carolina already under schedule before last year? Um, Fullerton was not. We had Coastal locked into the deal we're doing at Safeco. Uh, Rick Vanderhook's a great friend of mine at Fullerton, and, and I call all those guys. I call Fullerton. I call Loyola Marymount. We'll call Long Beach State and say, hey, when we're down there to play UCLA or, or SC, we'd love to pick you up on Monday. And... Uh, so Rick and I had kind of a funny conversation about that. He, you know, his point was, you know what, I wouldn't mind having you back over here for a midweek game. So we kind of laughed about how the thing went last year. And like I said, we're friends. And, and uh, so we got him on the schedule late, which is a great road game for us, great for the RPI. So it'll be a good experience for us. It makes it a tough weekend, three at UCI. They're ranked. They're going to be good. Then you roll into uh, Fullerton on Monday probably starting somebody who, who may never have started a college game before and uh, in front of a, probably a hostile group of people, but that's what makes it fun. When, when the last season ended, would you have guessed that Wayne House would be back this year? And why do you think you can get more draft love? And is there any issue to help in the draft? Yeah, you know, <laughs> the draft is the most inexact science I think I've ever dealt with in this game as a college coach. and I. I would never um, criticize the pro game for what they're looking for, but what surprised me was I thought he was what they're looking for. I mean, I mean, now it's about as often as you can find it, hitting the ball out of the ballpark. And this is a guy that he hit home runs off lefties. He hit home runs off righties. He hit 300 against right-handers. He hit 300 against left-handers. He hit 300 overall. He drove in over 60 runs. You know, I, I'm... I'm disappointed that we weren't able to get him out on the field a little bit defensively because I think that was some of their questions. I think they came in expecting him to pitch and they kept waiting for him to pitch. And then by the time they realized he wasn't going to pitch, he had had 13 or 14 home runs. And it's like, holy cow, maybe this guy can hit. But where do you play him kind of thing? And Joe's athletic. Joe's a big dude. So people assume he's not a very good athlete, but he can play first base at the pro level. And we'll get him out there. We've committed to that. We said, Joe, if you come back, you know, we'll do everything we can do to get you out there. So you'll see him probably in the midweek, get a little time at first base so those guys can see him there. Is there a step forward for him? in Batter's box kind of oddly the year last year. What does that look like? You know, wow. I really don't know 
And we can all get better at everything we do, and, and obviously, but I mean, he did everything. I mean, he beat the shift last year. He, like I said, he hit 300 against righties and lefties. He hit the ball at the ballpark. He hit big home runs. Um, there's a great presence with him when he's around the other guys. I mean, a lot of our guys saw this guy on TV last year from a long ways away and thought he was you know, kind of a freak physically. And then when you get to know Joe, you realize what a great kid he is and what a gentle person he is and what a great teammate he is. So if he just continues along those lines, I mean, I, I think he can be one of the best run producers this place has ever had. Last season when Pac-12 went down to the final weekend, it's looking equally as strong this year. you got national champions, Oregon State, Stanford, UCLA, all ranked in the top 25. Uh, how does that kind of impact the way you guys look at the Pac-12 season? We expect every weekend in the Pac-12 to be an absolute you know, dogfight, cage match. I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm not interested in what other people say about our league, good or bad. I, I think I know a little bit more than they might about who we're going to play, and I expect everybody to be better. I expect every weekend to be a bloodbath. We always do, and, and we, we always tell our guys that regardless of who we're playing, it seems like it's a tie game in the seventh inning on Sunday, and it's one game apiece. And, and however you get there, that's where you end up. And so, you know, the chemistry issue and the, the toughness and the willingness to be unselfish, those things, I think, separate people on Sundays and then end up separating people from the top half of the league, from the bottom half of the league. And, and I'm hoping that will be a, a strength of ours again in a really good league. Uh, you know, I think Oregon State will be as well coached as they've ever been. I mean, Pat did such a great job with his staff, with his players. You know, like I had talked about with our guys in terms of player-driven leadership. I mean, those guys just have a plan. They stick to it. It's tough to get them off that plan. And I think that's a, a credit to their entire approach to what they do with their players. So I don't think many things are going to change there. Um, and Dave Esker, you know, Dave's one of my good friends in this game. And Coach Marquis um, was someone who uh, had been coaching college baseball since he was, I think, in his mid-20s. I, when I was at uh, Chico State, we were playing UC Davis one time in a, in a really important Division II weekend series, and I remember that was back in the day where Division I's would play Division II's and not get hammered for it on the RPI. And the, and the Davis guy was telling me, he goes, hey, we played Stanford last weekend. He goes, what does it mean when you exchange lineup cards and the home plate umpire asks the opposing coach if he'd autograph the lineup card? <laughs> and you know, that's the kind of presence Mark Marquis had. And the same with, with Pat Casey. So our league misses those guys, but uh, uh, those programs are, are right where they've always been and, and going to be as challenging as ever. Uh, you know, that's a great question. Um, we talk about uh, the balance we like. We have a kid named Roly Nichols, also from Cerritos, left-handed hitter, who uh, uh, we think is somebody off the bench certainly would help us and might match up with some right-handers and be a guy offensively that can do some things from the left side of the plate. Um, he's somebody that's a luxury to have right now because he's almost like a fourth outfielder and like I said, somebody off the bench. Um, those two guys right now, I think we'll, we'll get the majority of the looks. What's Ronnie Prettyman brought to your staff, Coach? Ronnie's been great. Ronnie is a problem solver. He's a guy that um, day in and day out, like you want your team, he shows up and he's um, exactly the same every day. It doesn't matter what we did yesterday. It doesn't matter what we've got on, on our plates for today. He's going to come in and he's going to do whatever he can do to make our guys better players that day. And, and uh, you know, I'm a little more emotional, I think, than Ronnie. I have a, a few more highs and lows than he does. So he's really great to have with our kids because he keeps them on the straight and narrow when sometimes uh, I might challenge them a little bit more. And, and he helps them get over the hump. And R Ronnie was an accomplished player. Ronnie played in Omaha. He won a national championship. He's an ex-Fullerton guy. 
He was a draft pick by the Mariner, who, Mariners who got to AAA, played for a long time, and so we think it's neat to have Ronnie on staff because everything, and I mean everything, everything these guys want to do, between the lines, off the field, the draft, uh, deal with uh, the college game, and try to do well in school, everything that they want to do, Ronnie's done it, and he did it well, and he's helping our guys understand how to do that. Conversely, you've had uh, Kelly with you a number of yeah. years now. Talk a little bit about the leverage and the positive when it comes to sustainability of having somebody who's been together with that long. Yeah, J.K. and I were laughing the other day because I think this is his – goes by so fast. I think it's his seventh year here. And I, when he told me that, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how fast it had gone by. But uh, – you know, J.K. is a special guy. J.K. is unique because he's a pitching guy, but he's also a really, uh, really intelligent bench coach type guy. He's easy to talk to in the middle of the game about our hitters, their hitters, how we're going to defend somebody, what maybe we should come back and do on Monday because of the way the weekend went. This game's become so specialized. Most pitching guys that I've dealt with, man, it's pitching and pitching only. It's you, it's their pitchers, how they're going to pitch, um, who we're playing, that type of thing. J.K. J.K. could be a hitting coach at this level. He could be a head coach at this level. He could step into the pro game and uh, do some things at that level. Really, he's just a really talented guy from a great baseball family. Dad was a great baseball guy. His uncle was on a big league bench last year, the Cincinnati Reds, is in the Reds organization as a minor league manager. His brother was a great player and is in the Dodgers organization as a coach. This is a guy that grew up in the game and lives it 24 hours a day. So we're really blessed to have him here. He'll, he'll be a head coach at this level. If that's what he wants to do. When the time is right for him, um, I mean, he can write his own ticket. He's really good. Nick Hill caught over 90% of the innings last year. Are there any plans to reduce his numbers a little bit? or? Gonna... Yeah, I mean, we would – when, when Willie – Willie was hurt last year. And so, uh, by the time we got him back, Ben Baird got hurt. And so, Willie had to play third for Benny. Um, Michael Petrie is a junior from Mercer Island who's an accomplished catch and throw guy. He's somebody who will be able to step in and do some things to give Nick a break. If we're able to do some of the things we want to do midweek, which might be get Joe Waynehouse to start at first base, put Nick Kale in the DH spot to get him out from behind the plate, and maybe bounce Michael Petrie back there, then, then uh, we've got two talented freshmen, catchers who are both offensive-minded guys. They're accomplished hitters, but they need some work behind the plate. But those are guys who we'd love to get in there as well. It would help us to do that. So in the world of development, that's obviously part of your business, freshman catchers in particular, they're what, what you need out of them defensively and calling games and so on. Is there particular attention you have to pay for that when you bring in two freshman catchers and you want to use them and you need to develop them? You have a plan? Yeah. Well, these guys are both um, Colton Castanelli from Arizona, left-handed hitter, uh, really physical, you know, can be a middle-of-the-lineup type guy in the Pac-12, and that's what attracted us to him. The fact that he can catch makes it even more attractive. But, but both these guys, him and Albert, um, our other kid from Leland High School in San Jose, they're both athletic enough to play other positions. So depending upon how things go in terms of one separating themselves from the other defensively, uh, either one of them could end up at first base or in left field if they continue to hit. And, and we knew that as we recruited them both, and we talked to both of them about it. They've both really put the time in to get better defensively, but they, they have a long way to go. It's, it's such a tough gig. It's like, it's like being a freshman quarterback in this league and having to trust somebody with the keys to the car. And, and uh, you know, we always laugh about that and, uh, until – Somebody else is making your house payment for you. You don't want a freshman catcher back there because you're just that's just a tough deal for everybody. So, but those guys, you know, they're 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 learning and they're getting better. And so, we'll see them out there at some point. Are there any other freshmen that you're expecting to have an impact like Greenboard did last year? You know, 
we've got so many veteran guys back. It's it's hard to see any one of our position players, freshman wise, when we take the field against UC Irvine, um, stepping in there and making an immediate impact. David Rhodes is a right-handed pitcher, um, one of the Canadian kids who he will pitch that first weekend, and he's a candidate to to throw quality innings on the weekend. And and I think by the time this thing gets to the halfway point, I think he's going to be an important piece of this thing. So I think that's a name to think about. How did a nice run of talented catchers, um, and not just talented, but actually produced, produced at the plate. Um, is there a secret sauce there you're trying not to let out to the rest of the, the country? Because that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, you know, I honestly believe that you know our, our commitment to pitching and defense, everybody talks about it but not everybody really lives it. I mean, we are really committed to that. And when we say defense, we really mean as much as anything, defense up the middle. So, you know, there were some questions about Joey Morgan's bat coming out of high school, and that scared some people. There were some questions about Austin Rye's consistency at the plate, and that scared some people. And we were so infatuated with their defense. Um, that we felt like, you know what, if these guys hit 250 and defend, catch and throw the way they're capable of doing, you know, it's going to be fine for us. And they came in and they got so much better offensively, they made themselves into prospects. And Nick's kind of the other way around. Nick was an offensive guy who we felt like uh, needed some work defensively, and he's, he's done the opposite. He's come in and, and hit like we thought and was a little undersized, so, you know, People were a little bit afraid of that, but we've, you know, it's been part luck, part hard work, and, and part willing to commit to the defensive part of it. What do you expect offensively from Jonathan Schiffer this year? I think Schiff is the guy who gets the hit. You guys are all writing about the next day, and people are saying, you know, who's that Schiffer guy? Uh, you know, we talk about launch angles, we talk about analytics, we talk about in the air versus on the ground. Um, but I'll tell you this, when there are two outs and the game is on the line and the tying or winning run is on base, you want Jonathan Schiffer up at the plate. You know, Schiff ties the game up for us at Fullerton in game three in the ninth inning with the runner on second base and just does what he does, which was a nice controlled line drive swing. It's a ground ball in the six hole for a base hit. And he's kind of picked up where he left off that way all fall. But he's also gotten stronger. You know, Schiff's a guy we take for granted. Um, does a good job at first base. He'll be in that role again. And, and uh, uh, like I said, he's a guy I hope gets up with runners in scoring position because he takes those good at bats. Are we going to see him at first base mostly still, or is he going back to third? I think you'll see him mostly at first base. Or are we going to have Ben Barrett at third? Ben Barrett is back, and he's healthy, and he's been uh, really – Productive defensively um, at third base. Um, he needs to improve on some things offensively to be the kind of guy we want him to be to drive in runs, and he's getting there. But, I mean, he's an elite defender at third base, and he can really play defense over there. And, and when the offense catches up, I think he's going to be a pretty good player. And he's healthy, which is important.